open up the Penguins were changing. It's able to come out relatively easy. This keeps Primo with the first. Primo cuts it and scores! There it is! Keith Primo! The much maligned center of the Philadelphia Flyers wins this game in the fifth overtime. Everybody, it's Isaiah, and I'm here with Chef B, who's going to tell us about one of our sponsors here. Chef? Yeah, OMB Podcast is now brought to you by Summit Public Adjusters. The winter months can be especially hard on our homes, from roof damage to peeling siding to frozen pipes and toilet overflows. Call Summit Public Adjusters before you call your insurance company. Dealing with your insurance company can be stressful and confusing. Let Summit Public Adjusters take the stress out of the claim process by having our guys work for you. Get the most for your money and your repairs. The next time the big snow or the rain leaves you with some home damage, contact us for a free consultation. Some public adjusters are licensed in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Learn more at summitpublicadjusters.com or call 215-752-0560. Just tell them that the chef sent you. Yeah, what was that number again, chef? 215-752-0560. Uh, that's terrific. All right, we're going to carry on with the rest of our show. And we are back. It is Isaiah. Welcome to the OMB Podcast, episode number 176, as the Flyers are out west and things have kind of gone south while they're out west. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the upcoming trade deadline and a whole bunch of other stuff as the Flyers are 1-3-1 one, and one since our last, our last show. And they've lost four out of their last five, including four in a row. We'll get to that, but let's introduce the panel. As you know, the great Dan Silver is away on a work assignment. You can follow him at, at DSilver88 on Twitter. But with us tonight, as always, to my left, Chef B. How are you, my friend? A little sleep deprived from all this this whole West Coast uh, Flyers after dark stuff, but we'll we'll catch up eventually. Oh yeah, yeah. I I, I saw the first period and then I did the rest on the uh, this morning on the on the elliptical, and I'm like, oh boy. But I, I, I toughed it out. But before we uh, introduce our guests tonight, just a reminder that the OMB podcast is on 12 podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, TuneIn, Deezer. We have a YouTube channel, just plug in OMB podcast. We have a Facebook page. You can find us on Getter at OMB podcast, at OMB podcast. Everybody has to have a backup plan. The key point being, if you, uh, if you could follow, subscribe, whatever is um, applicable to your particular platform of choice we'd appreciate it it moves us up the charts when people are looking for philadelphia flyer podcasts and we do appreciate that so without any further ado let's introduce a man that is uh part of philly philadelphia flyers broadcast network he has a couple podcasts stick to hockey he has stick to f1 with anthony mingioni another one of our buddies and you know him as jason martinez what's going on boys well, not the Flyers these days, right? Yeah, these after dark games, like Chef was saying, I dread them because it's it's a really late night because the game gets over at like quarter to one uh, against you know the game. Who did they play last game? Vancouver. I'm dizzy. Vancouver, right. um, I mean, didn't had a lot of times, but the game gets over at like quarter to one. Then you got to wait for all the post game stuff to happen. We wrap up post game show about one fifteen. By the time I get the whole podcast voiced recorded and ready for posting it. I'm, I'm hitting the, I'm hitting the sack at like 3 a.m. It's just yeah. uh, Oh, thank God. That's the last 10 o'clock. We have a nine o'clock or left and a couple eight thirties. They're not that bad, but this 10 o'clock and I'll tell you San Jose, they got to be taken off the calendar because they do 10 30 out there. So <laughs> enough. I, I have a rule that I've mentioned that if an East coast team is coming to your city, and it's on a weekend, 
you shouldn't be playing at 10 o'clock at night. You play at five o'clock your time. So that way it mitigates the lateness for the East Coast team and its viewership. And if you're in San Jose and you're, if you're playing a West Coast team, you're playing the Kings, you can play at 1030 because that's your usual time. But if you're playing the Flyers or the Rangers or the Devils, you got to play at minimum 10 o'clock. This 1030 thing is ridiculous. I'm venting now, but, and they haven't even played San Jose since the Christmas break, for goodness sake. But the late night games are tough because we're all on East Coast time. Those players are on East Coast time. Yeah, they go out a day early. Stop. They're on East Coast time. It's like a beer Uh, league game, for goodness sake. It, it, yeah, it, it is ridiculous. And that extra half hour makes a difference. Oh, half hour at night is two hours in the morning. Yep. You know, it's, it's, it's such a difference and you're just totally crapped out for a couple of days. And I can't imagine like the flyers after the game on Thursday in Seattle, they flew after the game to Vancouver. Now it's not a long flight, but all said and done by the time you get on the bus, get to the airport, you got to do customs too, which is no bargain. So what, what a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of what may be coming a little bit of mini nightmare is the Flyers recent play uh, in the midst of uh, a losing streak here. Like I said, losing four out of last five. It's really funny. Is interspersed with that was right after the Islanders loss at the beginning of last week was the uh, Edmonton game, which might have been their best game of the year in terms of process, structure and just a total team effort. And now we see the uh, juxtapose that with the, the efforts versus Seattle uh, back to back at home and, uh, you know, up there. And what to, you know, what to think about Vancouver in that game last night? I thought the Vancouver game was, it wasn't an effort issue. I thought that, you know, I thought they played hard in the game. They generated a lot more chances, you know, the out scoring chances two to one out chance them. Um, the score was the same as that Seattle game, six to two, the final, there was two empty netters obviously in Vancouver, but so the result looks exactly the same, but watching the game, it definitely was not the same. The Seattle game, they didn't, they didn't look like a team that was ready to play that wanted to play and wanted to play to a high standard, which Torts has talked about. Matter of fact, he said, you know, before the Vancouver game the day before he said, this is a subject we haven't had to broach with this group very often about being ready to play and playing hard and doing the right things. But the last two games are staring us in the face. And in the first Seattle game, I thought, you know, they came out in the first five minutes, played really well, got two power plays, scored on one. And then it was like, okay, we're done for the night. And Seattle took over. And I talked to Torts when I had him on last week, I talked to him last Wednesday and I asked him, I said, I think the thing, probably frustrates you the most is that you played a really good first five minutes. You got out of the gate good. And then you let them up off the mat and, and you let, and you gave them some things and that does bother them. And that second Seattle game, the one out there, the six, two loss was, I mean, they just didn't look good in that game at all over, you know, for the most part this season, they've played really hard, but I also asked towards about, you know, this time of year coming out of the all-star break, you're in the dog days of the season. It's, and not as easy to get up for games, but this is where being a pro and and holding yourself to a high standard no matter what matters. But this is the time when slippage could happen, especially when you've got a lot of players on this team that they're asking to do more than they've ever done. Whether that's Travis Connect, who's killing penalties, is a top penalty killer. He's a top five on five forward in all situations. He's a top power play guy. This is a role that he's never been in. And he goes to 0 for 13 with scoring goals after the hat trick against Washington. And, you know, what I saw was a mentally tired player. He seems to be snapping out of it, The you know, especially the Vancouver game. I thought he was excellent. He had seven shots on goal. He yeah, attempted yeah. 12 shots. So he was good in that game. But, um, you know, a lot of guys are hitting a wall right now, and it's hard to, to scale the wall or knock down the wall, if you will, at this time of year when you know you're not a team that's headed for the playoffs. So that's human nature. But – it doesn't matter. Um, you know, when you have these points in seasons, you got to be able to plow through it. And that's playing to a high standard no matter what and being a pro. And, and that's what Torch is kind of trying to bring this year. And he's going to find out a lot about guys right now when things are tough. Because you're going to get in the – if you get in the playoffs, when you eventually get there, you're going to hit some a lot of adversity, a lot of walls, and you're going to have to find a way to get through them. So th- this is, I think, a good thing for the Flyers to find out even more about what guys are about. 
Yeah, this is kind of like the advanced placement test or course yep. where you find out about what Noah Cage can do now that he's playing many more games than he's ever played before. And, and like center. you talked about connecting <laughs> right at yeah. center. And so guys are like you were saying, are asked to do more than they've been asked to do in in the past. And so it just is part of developing the standard as well. It's the staying power, the consistency, Chef. Yep. Yeah, my, my my question. I know we, you know, even Torres brought up the lack of offense, and and I'm looking at TK, and he was in that dry spell. It seemed like he was, you, you say mentally, but as part of that, I'm guessing is it seems like the teams knew that if they could shut him down or get him off his game, and they looks like he got they, you know, they were taking runs, little shots at him here and there. They were really chirping him and and hitting him and making it very uncomfortable him for all the things that he usually likes to do to make his game better. It, it, you know, do you think that a, a little bit too is if we can shut down TK, they can shut down the flyers if they can get him off his game. Cause he did take a couple bad penalties here and there along the way. It, you, you think that that was, the, I look back at those games and I, I've rewatched a couple of them and it looks like that they, it was intentional. That was part of their game plan because they knew they could get to him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they knew that he's their best offensive player and he was on a 10 game, 20 point streak. I mean, it, he was unbelievable in those 10 games up until that hat trick against the Washington Capitals. I think I want to say on the 22nd of uh, January. So he's on a heater. So teams are going, hey, they don't have a lot of offensive options there. If we can shut him down, we'll take our chances with Owen Tippett or you know, Joel Faraby or Morgan Frost or Kevin Hayes beating us. But if, if we can just keep this guy off the board, our chances are real good. And he was on a heater, and I think teams bared down on him. You always want to force a team, that your opponent, into beating you with their weakness. You know, take away their strength and go, okay, now beat us with your weakness. And that's depth scoring and, you know, a lack of high-powered offense. And that's what teams did. And He's got to be able to play through that. And, you know, part of that mental thing that I talk about with TK, too, is also the fact that he knows he's on a team that doesn't have a lot of offensive weapons. They're relying on him to score. That can weigh a player down. I mean, they're asking him to, to be the catalyst offensively every single game. And he's, he's a really good player, and he's a high-end player, and he's got game-breaking ability. But he's not Connor McDavid. He's not Austin Matthews. He's not going to put up 50 goals. And he's not going to give you 100 points. He's not that player. So you're asking, you're kind of, you know, pigeonholing him with that duty, but he's not that player. So that's another thing that can weigh a player down mentally. And you can feel that pressure of having me, having to be the guy that put the puck in the net every night. And eventually that is going to wear you down a little bit mentally. You know, there was a couple of games where he didn't get any shots on goal and he wasn't working his way to the middle of the ice. You know, coincidentally, the two goals he scores against Seattle in garbage time, which meant nothing to the outcome of the game, but meant everything to getting the collar off him and the weight off his shoulders. Where were they scored from? Right in front of the net on both. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's where you got. Look, you want to score goals in this game? Go to where they're scored. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) You want to not score? Hang out in the corner. You know, you're not going to score from there. So um, going to those spots, you know, is a big determining factor for him. And, you know, getting goals off the rush, which I'd like to see him do, too which he was doing during that, that hot streak, that that's going to be, have to be a catalyst. Cause right now they have to work so hard to generate offense. It's almost like you got to generate chaos to get a goal. Like you saw yeah. in that Morgan Frost power play goal with R- yeah. Risto in front, you know, yeah. like a bull in a China shop. So yeah. you know, all those things. A quick follow up <laughs> to that real fast. Okay. So you'd mentioned, you know, Farabee and you mentioned Tippett as well as having to, to jump in. See Tippett's, uh, you, you can obviously all the, see all the work there with Tippett. Farabee is getting a lot of slack on Twitter and, and, and mm-hmm. in the fan base. But, I mean, it, it seemed like he came out pretty decent, and then he had, he's, he's had his ups and downs all season. It, do, we, do we think it's possibly, like, still the, the backs, you know, bothering him and all that to surgery, to post-surgery? I think it plays a part in it to an extent. You know, when you start a year and you haven't been able to train, and, you know, you go through a camp – where, I mean, he was in a non-practice jer- or non-contact jersey at the beginning of camp. So you look at him and you go, this is a guy that's been trying to play catch up all year long. 
And you you guys know what the practice schedules look like for this team. It's been pretty non-existent because there's just yeah. no time to practice because the NHL schedule is so bananas. They decide to get players like a week and a half off around the All-Star break. But then we'll play seven games in, in 10 days. Like, come on, like this something doesn't make sense here. So he's been I think he's been playing catch up all year. There was a couple points in the first half where I looked at his game and I was like, okay, it looks like it's starting to come around. And then he would kind of go dark again. So I think he's just been trying to catch up to it all year. And, I mean, he's got 26 points in, in 57 games. Last year he finished with 34 points in, in 63 games. So he, he's about on the same pace, um, but his goal scoring is down a little bit. He's a 20-goal scorer in the league and did that in 55 games in that shortened season. Um, so you want more from him at this point. And he's been just up and down, kind of like a toilet seat all year. And – you know, at moments looking like he's going to get his game back together, but it doesn't come completely back. I think it's part of it, but he won't use it as an excuse. If you know him at all, the way he is, it'll drive him to work harder. But having an off season where you can't really train and you have to recover from a surgery like that. Yeah. I mean, look at Eichel. It took him a while and he's kind of been up and down a little bit at times too. You know, out there, they, you know, Butch Cassidy is, Bruce Cassidy, excuse me, <laughs> not, not the Sundance kid, although they call him Butch, um, has called out Eichel a few times and said, you know, we need more from you. And I think that, you know, those necks are kind of tricky for a player. Right? Yeah. And I think part of it, too, is trusting your body after you have something like that. You know, it takes like an extra year, like they say with the NFL running back back in the day. You get a knee surgery that first year back. Yeah, it's healed and everything, but you don't trust it completely until the next year. And then you can bust back out. So we'll see if that's the case with Joel or not. But it's it's been a bit of an underwhelming year. Yeah. Yeah, there's no question about that. Um, you know, talking about some of the comments recently by John Tortorella, he's looking for a stabilizer game now that they have had these efforts. I don't think Vancouver qualified in that regard, even though the effort was better. Maybe it was a little bit of a step up from where they were, versus, certainly versus Seattle. But now they have a back-to-back -back coming up against Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, I guess it's uh, tomorrow night, Monday and Tuesday. You know, if this, I mean, one of the concerns is, is that a lot of what was accomplished as we're trying to take this advanced placement course, if you will, that, you know, they could fall back. And it's like a lot of things that are positive that John Tortorella instilled or installed with this team structurally and otherwise, or work ethic wise, could start falling off the rails. So, like, is that something that's on your mind right now as they proceed through this part of the schedule? Absolutely. I think it's the number one thing on my mind. Uh, I talked about it before the Vancouver game on the pregame show that they need to come out and control what they can control. And the things you can control are being ready to play and, you know, effort and getting in the way of shots and blocking shots and maintaining your structure. Although that could be a mental fatigue thing too. When you're tired, like the structure kind of is one of the first things to go away, but you know, every team goes through it. Every team's playing 82 games this year. So you got to find ways to deal with it. But you know, it's when I talked to Torts, I said, is this a time when you could have slippage in structure and, readiness to play and you know being that resilient team that you guys were for so much of this season you know I, I kind of likened it to being on an airplane where the nose starts to dip and you just need to pull back on the stick to pull the nose up before the plane starts to take a steeper dive that's where they're at right now they need to pull the nose I thought they played a decent game against Vancouver you know I mean they outplayed I thought Vancouver they outpossessed them they had like I said two to one scoring chances they outshot them significantly. Um, they just ended up on the wrong side of it, and they just didn't generate enough grade A offense, and their mistakes were egregious. But, you know, they got to pull up on the stick, or you don't want to happen this season what had happened two years ago in March when they just, just nosedived into earth. And then they came back, and the nosedive happened all over after a decent start again. So you don't want that to happen. There's a lot of guys that got a lot of skin in the game right now. Tippett, Frost, Faraby. I mean, there's a lot of guys that maybe have had decent seasons and have taken a little bit of a step forward. And we found out, okay, maybe they are part of the future, but it's not determined yet. So there's still guys that got to prove they can do it through 82. One of the big things with Torts is I asked Bill this last week on Flyers Daily. I said, does, you know, 
a, a high standard of play make it a full 82 games? That's the question. Making it 55 games, that ain't good enough. It's got to be every day. Like accountability should never take a day off. And accountability is for everybody or it's for nobody. So this is a really important spot in the schedule. And you're facing a Calgary team on Monday afternoon at 4 o'clock that's fighting for everything they, they, they can right now to try and get in the postseason after a really big turnover offseason with Gaudreau leaving Matthew Kachuk, getting Huberto, Uyghur, Daryl Sutter's pissing everybody off there, Alan Walsh is commenting, all that. And then you got Edmonton who's looking for a little revenge from a 2-1 loss in Philly. So, And it's three games in four days. It's not an easy couple of days. And, boy, they're going to have to band together, get their structure back, and play hard, or you're going to have no chance in either game. Chef? You you had mentioned how, you know, uh, Torch is looking at these players and, you know, looking to see what's in them. And, you know, how much sway do you think he has – with current, I'm I'm sure we're going to talk, go into more detail about it with, with current upper management about who he wants to keep on this team. Like, do you think that there's somewhere down the line, like uh, let's say like a, a Nick Sealer type, and they're looking to get maybe a seventh round pick or something for him to trade him because you know, or for whatever reason, I don't know. But how much does you know, or or a player like Risto, who's really blo- blossomed under this this system here with him? Do you think he has enough swag to like say no? I, I want to keep that player. They're part of my future because, in all honesty, we don't even know the future of, of Chuck Fletcher at this point. But you know, uh, I was just wondering how much you think stock they have in him as the coach. A ton. When he sent out the letter and his name was signed to it, both at the beginning of the year and when he was hired to season ticket holders, and then the one he sent out two weeks ago. The fact that he sent that out and put his name on it and. You could tell it was his words. I mean, it was pretty obvious. It's the stuff he reiterates all the time. I I think he's got all the stock in the world in the organization. And his assessment of players is, you know, they talk all the time. You know, a GM and a coach talk every day, multiple times a day, and are always talking about players. So, you know, that communication won't come as any shock at some point of how he feels about a certain player. Um, And you mentioned, like, Nick Sealer, I wouldn't trade him for a seventh-round pick. Seven round picks got like about as good of a chance as the three of us of making it into the show. Just slightly better, right? You're not going to, I mean, although Joe Pavelski was a seventh round pick, um, that's the 03 draft. But I mean, you're not going to do that because he's a player that's making under $800,000 a year, has been really good for you this year. Mm -hmm. And even if he's your seventh defenseman next year where he's still under contract, under $800,000, I mean, you got to give me like a four, a fourth round pick to get Nick Sealer because of the, the cost efficacy and the chances of me getting a player with what you're giving up. So with a guy like him, but like Risto, you know, Risto's an easy one. Obviously, he's played a lot better. Brad Shaw has worked with him a ton. He's playing much more focused and not chasing plays and playing inside the dots and responsibly. He's been really good. And, you know, some people look at him and say, well, his value is probably higher now. You can probably deal him. Maybe you could. I don't know. But, um, you know, is he a guy that that Torts would want here long term? Yeah, that depends on, though, what you could trade him for. Because the part of the conversation that they have with that is, hey, we have some teams interested in Risto. That'd be $5 million coming off the books. Here's what we could get in return. What could we do with that? And there's always a cost per replacement. So when you take a player away – You've got to replace them. Like the whole next man up and guy in the farm system isn't always the right answer. So, I mean, the, really the big key with all of that, Chef, is this. And I think it's a really important point. I heard, haven't heard a lot of people talking about. This team, after this season, has to make a lot of decisions. But one thing that can't be a part of that decision or can't happen is that the team take a step backwards next year. You have to have a progressive step forward this year. And through 55 games, I think they have a progressive step forward. And we're finding out what some guys are. We're finding out some guys, you know, are a part of this going forward. And some guys aren't. And, yeah, they need more high-end talent and all that. But the one thing that can't happen is this team take a step backwards. No more backward steps. They were down before they got torts. They've taken a little bit of a progressive step forward. They're about 11 points better than they were 
at this point last season, but they got to keep moving forward. You cannot go forward and then back, forward then back. You can't do it. This fan base has been through enough. So whoever you assess as part of it, who's who and what's what, and who's a part of this and who isn't, got to make the right decisions. And the guys that you don't feel like are a part of it, you've got to replace them with better options. That's the big thing. How do you do that? Trades, free agency, you got to get creative and it's going to, but you got to move forward. You can't go backwards next year. Yeah. I mean, I mean how I, bad I, would so, that look if they tank next year in the wrong draft? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that is so important. I see a lot of that on social media and it's like, no, that, they, they decided not to blow it up. They feel like they have a core of young talent to build upon. It's a little bit of a harder way to go, but it's probably higher percentage because you see teams like Toronto making trades for depth players that they need. They have the stars, but they can't get through the playoffs for the opposite reason that the Flyers cannot even make the playoffs. So there's yeah. a balance. The Flyers there. have everything Toronto doesn't, but the Toronto has everything the Flyers doesn't. Yeah. If you could just combine the two, you know, with role players and, you know, to fill out a roster properly, but with the high end talent, then you'd have one hell of a team. But that's the problem. And the other part of the problem for a team like Toronto is what they're paying all those guys. You know, yeah, yeah, that's certainly part of it. That's something they're going to have to work out. I just wanted to step back a little bit because part of what you talked about, in which Chef was referring to Tortorella's um, influence with the organization in terms of players and what he wants, and he also tying that in with his desire to have as many meaningful games to evaluate these guys as opposed to being in garbage time and it's kind of like uh, September baseball. He doesn't want that. He wants to really get a feel for who is who. I think that drove the decision to bring up Samuel Urson and, and make him the backup because I felt like, and you can certainly, no one knew, knows more about goaltending than you as far as what Tortorella thought he was looking at when Stanstrom's in that. And it's just, I know he's been taken with Urson from the very first. What's your analysis of that whole scenario? I think you're dead right. If there's one thing I know about torts and all of our meetings and conversations that weren't even on the air, that nobody else heard, he hates meaningless hockey games. Because what you do in a meaningless hockey game is as meaningful as the result of that game. It doesn't matter what you do in garbage time. It doesn't matter if you're getting blown out by one and you got and play a great third period. The other team let their foot off gas. You know what I mean? We, I remember that on the Black Friday game when the Penguins came in. Oh, the team played a good third period. That yeah, was meaningless. He doesn't care about that. And a big part, Isaiah, absolutely, is goaltending providing this team with more meaningful games. Now, I just don't mean games in the standings. I mean inside games, keeping them close. Like if you're going to play against a really good team and you're down 4 nothing after the first, the rest of the game is meaningless. But if your goaltending is good, maybe that's 2-1 after the first period. Still meaningful. 3-2 heading into the third, like that game against Vancouver, where they're down a goal. Now it's meaningful. Now you can find out how guys react because human nature takes over in a blowout. Everything gets loose, and it's real easy to perform. So he wants meaningful games as, as many as he can get because he's trying to make an assessment, and you can only assess players – true you know abilities and true mental game when they're playing meaningful shifts in meaningful games as many as possible and as far as ursan goes yeah he was definitely taken with him at camp sandstrom was hurt Hart was hurt he got to see a ton of sam harrison and sam had a great camp he really did he had a good preseason had a great camp you know obviously he was with the team around the holiday and had a really nice run there after that carolina game where he got hooked and then got put back in because carter got run and all that. So, and then he went back down to Lehigh Valley and he performed well, got his first AHL shutout there, a three nothing shutout. I think he only had like 18 saves, but sometimes that game can be tough too. He had some tough saves in the third when you don't see a lot of pucks. And I think he just likes the goaltender's mental game, the way his approach. And in talking to Torts last week, um, the one thing with Sandstrom, like he makes some really good saves and he's a good goaltender, but there's just one more save you need in the game. And you saw that against Winnipeg when the 5-3 loss, when they went down 3 nothing, they battled all the way back. They kill off a 5-on-3 in the remainder of the penalty. And then a minute later, he lets in a softy. Just kind of goes right through him on the post. And you got to make those saves. 
Because as a goalie, like a head coach, a guy who's not a goalie coach is going to look at everything and say, you need to make every save you're supposed to make and give me a couple that you're not supposed to make. <laughs> like you need a save there. And that's been the problem. Even in Sandstrom's last start, it's a 3-3 game. And Jaden Schwartz scores that goal. And he just never recovers to his feet on his glove side, which has been a problem. I pointed it out four times this year where he stays down in an RVH position in his post on his glove hand side. He's gotten beat high glove twice because he's down and it's too hard to get the glove up that quick. And he's gotten beat high blocker twice because you can't shrug the shoulder up high, quick enough to do it in the NHL. Those guys will pay, make you pay. Got to regain your feet. Need that extra save. And, I mean, he said on my podcast last week towards Sam Harrison's the backup. He's the backup right now. They'll probably put Felix through waivers when they get back, and we'll see if he gets through. But um, Arison's his backup right now, and yeah, rightfully so. And, and yeah, no, it's hard. It's hard to disagree, and it made it a lot easier with Grosnick coming back uh, down in the Lehigh Valley back. from injury. Yep. Yeah, that shift. Yeah, I was just saying you, you were talking about all 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 of the talent. Uh, you know, we were talking about the younger players. How much talent do they really feel about, you know, of what they're going to keep this core that we talked about? How much of that help do you, do they really believe they think they can rely on coming up from the minors at this point? I know uh, there's been a lot of, uh, I guess, criticism of, of what they've drafted over in the Chuck Fletcher time here. And uh, I, I'm just curious what, what your opinion would be to what, what they think that I have and help on the way, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think it's hard to judge Chuck Fletcher's draft classes just yet. Be, I mean, you got to give it five years. Yeah. I think minimum, really. I mean, look at some of the players he's drafted. Um, Tyson Forster looks like definitely like an NHL player. Bobby Brink dealt with the injury earlier this year. Definitely looks like an NHL player. Are they high end? No, but they weren't taken, you know, at the top of a draft mm -hmm. or in the top ten. They weren't. Those guys weren't there, um, or they weren't drafting in that position. So. Um, but he's drafted. I mean, Cam York looks like a really good player. He's not Ke Cole Caulfield. He may turn out to be better than Cole Caulfield. Forwards can get to the show and, and have an impact much quicker than a D-man can, especially a D-man, you know, playing on his offside so often like he is right now. Um, for a guy like Cam York, who I thought actually has been since he's called up, been pretty good. So when you look at it all said and done, we'll see what the drafts are. Now, all these holes are not going to be filled by the draft. Like Denoy is another guy. Picked up his 18th goal tonight. Um, he's another guy that is going to be a good centerman, but he's not a top six centerman. You know, he's probably a third or probably a third line center in the NHL when he does get there. So you look at all those guys and you go, okay, can they fill all these roles? No, I don't think they can. I think you have to have some of them filled because it's still a kind of a flat cap world. And what do those guys all have in common? They don't make a lot of dough, <laughs> you know, they, right. they don't need up a lot of cap. So that's, you know, you got to get contributions from players on entry level contracts until this cap starts to rise. And even when it does rise, but you're going to have to go into the trade market into the free agency market if you want to significantly improve this team. And again, it's just going to depend on those assessments at the end of the year. OK, what guys are we ready to move on from and who can we replace them with with an upgrade that will determine whether we move on from them now or we have to wait on some of those players. Because, again, they can't take a step backwards. So I think you, that, that's kind of, you know, the conversation. Okay, this is a guy that I, I don't think is a part of it going forward. It just isn't a fit or whether it's personality, play, combination, anything. I don't know. Um, but can we replace him? Can, can we move him? What can we get in return? And how do we replace that spot in the lineup to make it better? That's the big key. So... Um, there's some good players in the farm system. Um, they have a lot of, you know, NH guys that will be NHL players, you know, the guys I mentioned, and then Ronnie Adder's another one. And um, there's some other guys down there. So um, they have that. But again, you still just lack the high end piece. Cutter Gauthier is having a, a really good year at BC. I'd like to see him go back to BC for another year. And when he comes up, be a winger, not a center right away, because I think it's a big responsibility for him at this level. But um, we'll see how that that part of the equation plays out, but um, he's probably the the highest end piece you have, along with Tyson Forster. But you know, no, those guys just don't jump in and, and fill the void that of some of the areas they need. I mean, they need some high end pieces. You need some top line guys. 
you need a top line center. And we got a, there's a huge question looming over the organization. Is Sean Couturier going to play this year and can he stay healthy? And what is he going to be? I think it's paramount. They find that out before this season's over. If they can, if he's cleared, he needs to play 16 or 18 games. Let's see what, what he can do. Can he get back and not have a setback? I want to know that before the off season, am I an LTIR with him next year or, and, and am I replacing him or is he going to be a guy that I'm going to bank on being in that lineup? Because I don't want to hear over the summer again, oh, I feel as good as I felt in years, blah, 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 blah. Been there, done that. I want to get that knowledge now. Yeah, I can definitely see that. We talked about it last week, and uh, Chef and I have a little bit of a disagreement. I think I'm more in your camp there because I, I just asked a question, you know, like, what if he can't play? I mean, failed back surgery is a thing, you know? Yep. And he already had, you know, he went back in for – like a correction to the surgery. I forget what they termed it as, but um, kind of finished the job that they didn't completely finish before, I guess. But I mean, that's scary. I, how, how big do you think it was that Kevin Hayes came back at the end of last year? Everybody was saying the same thing. I ah, shot him down. Kevin Hayes, when I talked to him on the pod, said he wasn't sure if he could ever play again and coming back and finishing the season. And he was way better when he came back the last time. Oh yeah. Still wasn't a hundred percent, but way better. He said he, Went into the offseason knowing he was still an NHL player and that if he had a good offseason, he could come in and produce. And he, he has – you say all you want about Hayes this season. He's produced a lot of points. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, sure. And what's the news on Atkinson? I, I, I haven't heard anything or, or is it – I mean, did he have surgery or did he not have surgery? Because mm-hmm. you're kind of in the same boat with him as well. I mean, you, you want to know what you're you're getting. And if you're going by that standard, you don't want to go into another offseason not knowing – well, with Atkinson, yeah, he did have surgery. It was season-ending surgery, so there was no okay. timeline to return this year. So, yeah, he's done for the year, so you won't be able to find that out. Um, so, I mean, that's – but, again, you're right. That's a big question mark. Is Cam Atkinson going to be, you know, at 32, 33 years old, a player that can come in next year after missing an entire year and be a guy that can contribute north of 25 goals and be reliable? I mean, guys, you know, I say this all the time. The only ability that matters in sports is availability. (laughs) I don't care how good you are if you aren't available to play. That's all. It's it's a huge element of it. And who's going to be available? We know. I think we know at this point. Ryan Ellis not going to be available. Like let's not even go down that road. Um, But Cam Atkinson's a big question mark, and Couturier is a big question mark. As was Kevin Hayes at the end of last year. Yeah, I don't. Th- yeah, there's there's no question, and you know, it kind of brings me to the the topic that everybody is really thinking about, especially kind of older, more veteran fans that have been watching the team for so long. You know, where the rubber meets the road, someone's got to make these decisions. You talked earlier about the letter that was put out, and it, that was to me a real positive that finally kind of along the same lines, not the same thing as the Rangers coming out with their letter and saying, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to take a step back and all this. Tortorella comes out with this letter we spoke about in our last show and finally gives the fans something, a concrete message, like it's going to take time, but we're going to take st- steps. And well, everybody's seen the the, uh, the letter by now is it to the season ticket holders. But it also said something else. I mean, I you can tell me what you think, but to me, it kind of like, there's been this chasm between the messaging of Tortorella and Chuck Fletcher. And that is highlighted in December about we're at the footers. We're kind of at the very beginning of this from Tortorella. And then Fletcher comes in and says, you know, we're only six points out of a playoff spot. And, 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 and then the letter is put out just recently, two weeks ago. And where's your GM? Isn't the GM the guy who is supposed to uh, crystallize the vision of what you know, he's building and communicate that to the fans. It's almost like he's been neutered. And then you couple that with the fact there were all these rumors from, from good sources, Anthony Sampolippo, Charlie O'Connor. We talked about with Kevin Durso, ESPN, South Jersey. And it seems like they were ready to make a move and push Chuck aside, put Danny in there. And the only decision left was whether Chuck was going to be with the organization in some capacity or not. And then they did like a 180. Now, you can say, hey, well, that's BS. It never happened, whatever. But I think you know where I'm going with this. Because mm-hmm. this is really critical, uh, a critical offseason. Like you said, they can't take a step back. 
They need, but they need someone creative to find a way to help them keep their level, but they have to create space. They have to get rid of some players that don't belong or were flat out mistakes like Tony D'Angelo, yet who still have some kind of benefit in their offense and that maybe other teams could use because they have to clear cap space. You can't be bad and expensive at the same time. So that's a lot of hogwash I'm throwing your way, but. So let me take it kind of in pieces. I I think the the reason why, because, and when the letter first came out, Flyers fans going, Finally, they're communicating with us, but why isn't it the GM? It was like, well, I, I mean, I think from a, a critical messaging standpoint, you go, okay, where will this be best received coming from who? So when you, they look at that, inter- I don't know that th- this conversation took place, but I imagine it did. Hey, if Chuck puts it out, it'll be shit on. If Torts puts it out, he has equity right now with the fan base. So... Towards it, and it was a follow up to towards his earlier message to season ticket holders when he was first hired. Um, but you know, we went from aggressive retool in January the year prior with that Dave Scott and Chuck Fletcher press conference, and things changed but weren't verbalized. And then the offseason was confusing because of, like you said, the D'Angelo move and some other moves. And you know, it's oh, what way are we going here? It looks like everybody's kind of going like. Go this way, you know, and you look at it and you go, okay, well, so so Torts puts that out because he has the equity with the fan base. And he's talked about on December 23rd when he was on my podcast, he used the word rebuild. And it was the first time we heard it from anybody. I remember putting out the clip the day before the interview came out, the full length interview. And it was the first time the R word rebuild was used. And he said, we're in a rebuild here. And he just talked about this last week when I had him on, too, was. You know, we got to take this slowly. We can't, you know, just want to do this quickly and not do it properly. It's going to take some time to which I said, you know, you can't microwave it because when you microwave food, it tastes like shit. You know, it tastes like it was microwaved. You have to do it slow cook. You have to do it the right way. Now, there's different ways to do it. You can tear it down and rebuild. And there's a there's all different ways. And it depends on what your situation is. But. You know, when it comes to the vision of what they want to do going forward, they have all got to be on the same page. They're going to have to be creative and you're going to have to take risk. You're going to have to. You're going to have to trade a piece that could bite you in the butt to take a big swing. It's just the way it is. If you want to do something big, you have to incur risk to do it because you're not going to be able to put out your recycle bin or your trash and have the trash man come by and leave a gold bullion in it when he takes away your crap. It doesn't work like that. No other GMs in the business of doing the flyers a favor. You know, they're all looking to get one over on the other guy or make a good deal for both sides, but you're going to have to incur some risk. So, um, you know, if they're going to build it going forward, they're going to have to make some savvy decisions. They're going to have to make some shrewd decisions and they may make some that aren't met publicly with, you know, high praise, but end up being the right decision. That's what it's going to take. And that's the only path I see to them doing that. And it's not going to be easy because they need the hardest thing to get. And that's high end talent. And, you know, we'll see if a guy like Dylan Larkin, it gets to free agency. They don't have control of that though, if he gets there. So there's a lot of variables here, uh, but they all need to be on the same page and, I mean, I know they communicate a lot about the vision and all that, but they got to execute the vision. Having the vision is great. Executing it is hard, and that's what they have to do. Yeah, I mean, it has to be a plan. They really haven't had one up to this point until Twitch came into the organization. I think think that's crystal and clear. I mean, two adjectives you use to describe what they need are savvy and shrewd. I don't think those are words uh, that – apply to Chuck Fletcher. And I'm, I'm, I am going to pile on the, um, this particular guy. I, I heard he's a great guy from everybody, but I, I think he's earned his way out of the organization. I don't think he should be here. And it puts the organization in a tenuous position that their, their coach is held in so much higher esteem than the general manager that they felt like they had to do what they did with the letter and everything like that. And it, it's not hard to point out the mistakes in the lineup and the, the acquisitions and, and, and the decisions that uh, Chuck made. I mean, you know, Tony D'Angelo every night, you know, for what was a second and third pick and, and, and whatever, and $5 million for, for two years, 
and, and thinking that – and Chuck is acting surprised that his defense is so bad. Well, you know, you're comparing Ivan Provorov to Jacob Slavin, and it's just not fair to, to Provy. And, and it just goes on and on. And I think as long as he's in the spot he's in, I just – I people are not going to have faith, and I think they're justified to feel that way. Yeah, I mean, look, sports are all about that. And it, it's – you can tell me a guy is going to do something great, and until he does – I don't believe it. It's like, hey, aliens exist. Well, I haven't seen them, so they don't exist in my world until I see it. You can tell me you had a sighting, but I can think you're full of shit, right? (laughs) So it's going to be a very difficult process because, you know, one of the things that the team did too was they extended guys when they were in a very depressed position. You know, that's, you know, you extend Ristolainen, you extend Sanheim, you do those things. And you do have to look at what they would get on the open market and, again, what the cost per replacement is. I mean, obviously, you know, A, Niskanen retiring, obviously threw a wrench into things, and then the Ryan Ellis acquisition on that top pair really did. And that put him in a really tough spot to try and fill what is such a key role on your top pair. I mean, it's just Mm -hmm. it it, like Tony D'Angelo was not going to come in and be able – to do what he did with Jacob Slavin. Cause like you said, Provorov's not Jacob Slavin. He's a good player and he's available and he plays a ton of minutes. And he's one of those guys that go, people say, well, I'll just trade him. And I go, well, okay. What are you replacing him with? Are you just going to put Cam York on the left side on the top pair? Do you think that's a good idea at, you know, as green as he is in the NHL, that's a big ask. And again, you can't take a step backward. So, um, you know, D'Angelo coming in, obviously the, the ideal role for him, is on a third pairing where you can shelter him in power play. You can mitigate his weaknesses and you can accentuate his positives. But being on the top pair with a partner short of Jacob Slavin is not ideal. And because Tony just adds so much risk to his game at times, but that's who he is as a player. He can defend a little bit better and make some better decisions. Yeah. But he's always going to have those elements in his game. And that's something you can't have on your top pair when you're trying to, your number one job is to control the top line of the other team, which is really hard to do. Every team's got a great top line. So that that's your first and foremost, that's job number one. And that's not his strength. Yeah, no no, no doubt. Chef. It, we, we talked about, we skirted around the issue. Uh, Well, Isaiah didn't, he wants to know when Fletcher's gone and (laughs) in so many (laughs) words, but uh, I guess the question is, we probably all agree. He's probably done. I think that's, that's more than probable. Uh, I just, at this point, um, how, how comfortable are you and and how comfortable should a fan base be? Is he going to be gone before or after the tread deadline before or after the season? I mean, I think, you know, if, if you're worried about his future, Altogether, I, I think you got to be worried about trusting the keys to the car with somebody when you're talking about your rebuild going future, you know, drafting and then making these trades at the deadline and such to make sure that your team gets better. Uh, past performance is marginable. So I, I guess where do you sit? I mean, do we see him go sooner than later or or after the season or how do you, how do you think it's going to be handled if it is handled like that? I mean, I, I don't foresee any moves like that being made in season. I really don't. Um, I I think, you know, this trade deadline is pretty chalk for the Flyers. It's one of those ones where you go, okay, JVR is going to be gone. If people are expecting, you know, Kevin Hayes or Ivan Provorov or Travis, those moves to happen at the deadline, I'm sorry, you're going to be disappointed because those trades don't make a lot of sense right now because you're trading a player away with term that, you can get more teams involved in a summertime in those kind of deals. There's only a limited number of teams that can fit a player with what they're making because you don't want to retain on player that's got three years beyond of contract. You don't want to be retaining that with like, like a horseshoe around your neck. So, you know, I, there's going to be pretty chalk here. It's going to be, you know, JVR, Braun's not going to get you a lot. Maybe Patrick Brown is another guy that gets moved, opening up a spot maybe for a Denoye call up, or, you know, you look at, I mean, maybe a D'Angelo because he's got one year beyond this if a team has that kind of need. Uh, but it's not going to be overwhelming what happens here. Maybe Nick Sealer, like we talked about in the beginning. So I, I don't think there's anything 
earth shattering that's about to take place by the deadline. Um, so I, I think like at the end of every season, there's going to be a full assessment within the organization of all elements. You know, Danny's kind of been sitting there and, you know, was in a finalist for that Montreal job before Ken Hughes got it. Is Danny ready to be a general manager? Um, if he is the general manager, who's a, a lieutenant advising him as a first time general manager. So, I mean, Danny's incredibly smart and incredibly likable, great guy and everything. Um, but you got to ask yourself all those questions too. So how does that assessment go in the off season and how does it play out? So that's part of the equation. You know, those are like the players. I think everything gets looked at for who's who and what's what and how the chips fall. We shall see. Um, but, um, you know, just simply saying, oh, well, you, you can can Chuck before the trade deadline and put Danny in there. I want to be careful um, because you really have one chance if you make a move to get it right. Because, again, we'll go back to it again. You can't take a step backwards. Well, so you get to do things strategically, not at the timeline of a um, of an angry fan base. You, uh, you don't, yeah. don't want to do things. Yeah, Dude. do things on the if you're making any moves on players, staff, coaches, management, anything, you do it. You don't make a move to make a move. You only make a move if it makes sense based on the assessment of the facts and how you move forward. That's all you do. And you make the right move. Don't just make a move to make a move. No, absolutely. You know what? What's that old expression? If you if you listen to the fans, uh, uh, you know, in soon terms enough of, you'll be sitting with them. That's right. Soon enough <laughs> you'll be sitting with them. Yeah, but I, I want to think outside the box a little bit here. You know, Flyers have their senior advisors, and one of the things I talked about last week or at our last show was that you know Danny Briere really could have been like actively part of the administration of uh, the Lehigh Valley Phantoms, getting some experience as a general manager or doing something like that. And he hasn't really had that. He did. He He's, did with the Maine Mariners, but that's Maine Mariners? East Coast League. Yeah. 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 But I mean, yeah. it's, you know, maybe at a higher level, I, I, it's almost like they need like a, a Pat Gillick kind of guy, hockey guy to come in and do what he did for Amaro. And Amaro had a couple good years there, a good run trying to extend what, what, what Gillick had started. But I guess what I'm really driving at, you know, if Dean Lombardi theoretically certainly has the pedigree to step in and be the general manager and oversee a search for a guy who could be that Pat Gillick, whether it's a Mark Yannetti. Uh, so uh, Lombardi uh, would be the Pat Gillick is what you're saying? Ex well, he could be or he could hire that guy. He could, okay. but he he's been in, in like that advisory position because, you know, it's, it's, def, it's a training job. There's no doubt about it. But if you have somebody you're, you're training like, like Danny and you kind of like before you hand the reins over, I mean, Lombardi is ideal or you could step out. Um, there's another guy, Yannetti. And who's the other guy in, in LA? They have a couple guys because they have such a great system. Yeah. 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 Um, well, there's somebody else in, in there. I can't think of his name, but it, it I think it would make more sense to have that kind of overseer. So Danny has the best chance to succeed. Well, uh, it's kind of like what you're seeing in Montreal too. Ken Hughes was hired. Jeff Gordon exactly. is the president. And you're seeing a lot of teams go to that, you know, kind of pseudo president like Brendan Shanahan with Kyle Dubas as the GM, right? Right. Like you're kind of seeing, you know, it's a guy there that, although Brendan Shanahan didn't have any experience as a GM, but anyway, but the point stands like Jeff Gordon and Kent Hughes. Right. I mean, Gordon was, you know, the GM of the Rangers. He got let go when that whole message went out on the team's Twitter. And he and who else was it? Who was the coach at the time? I can't remember. Didn't agree with the message that went out. Well, David. Um... Oh, yeah. David Quinn. Quinn, right. So when that message went out of, because of the Panarin incident, blah, blah, blah. And they end up, you know, out of a job. So Gordon is the president and he hired Kent Hughes. You know, I, I always look at. It, I think like Ken Hughes is interesting, and because and Bill Zito is interesting because they were right. former agents. Like, is it, I'd have a lot of room on my managerial staff for guys that were former agents because there's nobody that can assess player value like a former agent. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's always room for former, recent agents in the NHL with today's salary cap and structure and all that stuff. So I always look at those kind of guys and think that that's an interesting angle because so much in this 
what's been this flat cap where it'll eventually go up. It'll probably go up next year because they'll make a deal on the remaining escrow. But so much of building a team, we've seen it like Toronto. They hamstrung themselves, but they can't bring in D, right? And so much of the equation is how do you make these puzzle pieces of percentage of cap fit together? And to me, when you're signing a player, an agent can assess value, true value. And he can know when an agent's asking for too much, <laughs> right? right? Yeah, that's that's true. So, so there, there's I, yeah. always room for those guys on the staff that I have. I got some consultants that are former agents for sure. Yeah. Now, we speculated before in the past with this team that they should have more development. They should have more staff on to develop players. Uh, other teams seem to have larger a larger squad to do that and to help in the I don't know that to be true. Oh, they, no. They have a large yeah, they they committed a lot more to their oh, development staff right. over the last. Yeah, yep, they added a lot there. Huh. All right. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, we had Shane we had Shane Malloy on. He was talking about that and Shane you, you probably know him very well with his draft mm-hmm. uh, pedigree and how he, how he goes and talks to pretty much everyone around the league. And, you know, he has an opinion like everybody else. And, and, and there's a lot of people who agree and there are some certainly who, who don't necessarily agree with the particulars, but we do embrace the concepts that he was putting across when he's been on our show a couple of times. And I think, yeah, Jason, where I might part with you in here is I think the Flyers have so much to do to take that step forward. I think it's really imperative if it's at all possible if they can move a five million plus contract before the trade deadline, that's a box they're checking off that takes so much pressure off what they have to do in the off season. It gives what them do you that want in return, though. I don't really need a lot because I'm talking about if, if D'Angelo might have value. Are you willing to hold some salary to clear that that room on your cap for just another year? Because his offensive numbers are very good. Yeah. And he, he could take, you know, a team that, that needs some juice from their power play and play a role. Obviously, he played well enough in Carolina, and they, nobody who wants him now would be asking him to do as much as he did with, with, with Slavin. So, I mean, that, if they could do that, that would take a lot of pressure off the, the general manager, whoever's making the decisions going forward. And to yeah. me, I mean, I, I look at yeah. what, what, what he's maybe the did. only one though, because only has one year by, beyond this. Well, That's when I you mean, get into those multiple years that, you know, like Hayes is a guy, obviously, right? Who's got what four years after this? And three, and, I think three after this, or three after this one. Yeah. Um, and you go, okay, but team, how many teams can fit that? First of all, even if you retain some money, not many teams can fit it. Because everybody's up against the cap. You know, I, I talked to Chuck Fletcher, it's about two weeks ago, I think so now, um, about, you know, the market, and what it's doing and, and what the reasons are why it wasn't really moving a whole lot. And, and he told me, he said, there's two things in play. Well, three, they're the hard cap and everybody is up against it. You know, good teams are all up against it and they're not trading for a guy. You know, the Heim Ducks aren't making that trade. <laughs> to to try and get a guy like Tony D'Angelo teams with cap space or teams for the most part that are out of it. So they're not in play for a player like that. And the teams that need some help don't have the cap space for that much cap. And the reason why teams were waiting is two things. Number one is every day they wait is more money off the pro rate prorated salary. So if you go, I mean, if you go 10 more games, that's another eighth of that guy's salary that hits your cap number one. And then number two, and I didn't even think of this. A lot of teams are waiting on LTIR. They have players on LTIR, but they don't know if that player is coming back during the regular season or not. So they make that decision a little closer to the deadline. Like those teams that are in LTIR situations. Do we have the cap space if he comes back? Because if a player is cleared, he has to come back. You have to put him back on the roster. And if you don't have the cap space, now you're in real trouble, right? So that's part of the equation too, why, teams like to wait till the deadline is the prorated salary and the fact that they have a big question mark when it comes to LTIR space. It's not all kind of as cut and dry like it was with Kucherov where you knew he wasn't coming back for the regular season and you could bring him back in the uncapped playoffs. A lot of teams aren't in that same position. So that's part of the reason it's, it's a tough thing to move. Um, is it impossible? No. Is it likely? No. 
I, I don't think it's likely, but you never know if an opportunity presents itself and th- there's a team that is interested in doing something like that and you can make the right move. I, I'm not against it. I just think it's unlikely. Yeah, no, that's really, that's fair enough. Uh, t- two things come to mind. Number one, but, but really- I do agree with you that it, it, it almost gives you like a jump start into your off season in a way. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and of course, today we found out the really sad news about, uh, you know, uh, Jonathan Taze, which, which speaks to teams waiting to see if certain guys could be available. And then you find out at you know, at this late that, date. That could have an impact on Kevin Hayes, frankly, at the deadline. Yeah, it might. It I mean, might. Look at all There's the centers a- that have gone already. I mean, you, right. Ryan O'Reilly's off the market now. He's been traded to Toronto in, in a quite exorbitant package. And <laughs> you've seen some other guys move. So... Pretty creative there by Dubas, getting other people involved, paying the price. He's yeah. desperate. We get I it. I could see but... the Flyers taking on some money like that just for this year, eat some salary just to get a pick. Why not? Absolutely. Right. If you have Absolutely. the space, I don't, so, I don't see why you don't do that. Does that raise but, Hayes' stock now that all these other uh, centers are gone? You think, or that I, I still think that's got to be an off season move because you want to make sure you get it right and get your full return on that. But does it help you out in your negotiations a little bit? Yeah, because you're not in a position where you have to trade him. And if another team needs help, then and the cupboards are bare, O'Reilly's gone, and other guys are gone. You know, the more guys that are gone at the position and the less options teams have that want to upgrade there, then yeah, absolutely it helps you. It gives you more hand in any negotiation um, to be able to do. Like Colorado, look at them. They've been without Landeskog, right, all year. I mean, that's bit, that's caused them huge problems. You look at some teams that, you know, need some center play. Does, is Boston a team that could use a guy like that? Now, do they want to go, okay, I'm gonna, I don't want to trade for him with three years left at $7 million, but if you go, hey, we might get a better deal now than we get in the offseason and we can strike here if we retain two mil and he's a $5 million player for that team, you know, then you got to look at it. You got to consider there's no conversation or question from another GM. I don't ponder <laughs> if I'm, if I'm the flyers, I'm yeah. taking calls on anybody. There's a few, there's guys I don't want to trade, but I'm not hanging up the phone when they bring up player X's name. There's no player that I hang up the phone for. No, I mean, the, the catalyst behind Hayes for me, even despite even more than the disagreement between the player and coach is really like a 7.1, uh, million uh, dollar winger versus a center and the value of that player. And if, if he's not going to be a center here going forward, which could change, um, but doesn't look like it is, then it, it becomes uh, more of a necessity, if not now, certainly in the off season, but again, to be determined. Well, so, the player prefers to play in the middle too. That's part of yeah, the equation. That's yeah. part of it too. Yeah. Yeah. And then it gets to players in the off season. I definitely think we're more off season conversations. It's, it's pro you know, despite his, yeah protestations to, to the contrary. I don't think he's very happy here. And that, that's something, you know, that's like you said, he's a tough guy to, to replace and he's been playing better lately. So, yeah, and, and me, Cam York, I mean, it's a lot to do with that too. Yeah. To me, Provy is like an offensive lineman in football. If you don't say his name a lot or hear his name a lot during a game or in a game, then he's, pro- he's done his job. Right. Yeah. If you don't hear, if like you don't hear Lane Johnson's name at all in an Eagle game, you know, nobody beat him. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody true. ever does with that guy. But th- to me, that's the kind of player that he is. He's not a flashy player, but he's just a stabilizer. He he's always available. Um, but we'll see that. I mean, that's again, that's one of those tricky ones. I mean, you could end up with some egg on your face. There's going to be some risk if you made a move with a player like that because of a what you replace him with and b what he does when he goes forward. You know, connect me the same way. You know, people go, his value is never going to be higher. And I probably agree with that. Um, But, you know, does he become another one of those players that you go, he's hoisting the cup, a former flyer, whether it's Justin Williams or Braden Shen or uh, Luke Shen. Jesus, I mean, this list of guys that win cups after they leave, you know, it's like, oh, geez. So You didn't miss Luke, though. I mean, nice guy. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. (laughs) I don't miss him because he was nobody sweat more than he did. When I would interview him, there'd be so much water <laughs> pouring off this dude. It was like a faucet. And he would just wow. drench like the 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 foam thing on my microphone. It would just be dripping off his nose onto it. I'm like, oh, I can't even interview. Uh, Got to replace another <laughs> foam now. 
Yeah. But it's Every shame. time he was on, I bring out the Luke Shem one. It was like covered in plastic, like your old grandmother's couch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's a shame about Luke, man. He gets rushed in Toronto. He needed more development time. And I'm glad he carved out a, a good career. And then it, the, the trade that they uh, made for – it wasn't fair to him. So, uh, you know, with JVR, JVR has his best years in Toronto and all that. That's not his fault. You know, he's gone on and, and done pretty well for himself. The fact that he's still playing after the kind of career he had is a, a credit to his work ethic and his maturity. So I give him a lot he's of credit. A, he's a value target at the deadline again, too, Luke yep. Shen. He had a real good game against the Flyers. He had two nice assists in that game. Yeah. Yeah. yeah always do. Definitely an yeah. alpha dog. Yeah. Uh, like he's doing his Adam Foot impression. But uh, Jace, one last question for me. Um, James Van Riemsdyk, the Flyers willing to hold enough salary to maybe squeeze out a second round pick to get this player because they got they, they they don't have a second in the next in this coming draft or or twenty four for that matter. Yeah, I think. I mean, you're gonna re- you can retain up to half and up to half. If, yeah, right. that's gonna yeah. if that's gonna make the return better, then yeah, absolutely. Why not? Yeah. I mean, it's no skin off their back this year. So, yeah, I, I think what you'll end up with there is probably a conditional second round pick. Okay. Um, it'll have some conditions on it, but I mean, James, if he goes to a team, is going to play. So he's going to, they're going to meet the conditions. But that'd be a good return for James Van Riemsdyk. So, like, if they win one round of the playoffs, it becomes a second. Yeah, or, yeah X amount of games. And, right. You know, conditions like that that they'll put on it. And, you know, James will score. And, and the thing about him, too, is, the thing that makes him so tradable is a you can eat half, and b he'll fit into any locker room. I mean, he's yeah. just a he's pro's a pro's pro. pro. Yeah. yeah, great guy. I mean, not going to cause any problems. Going to be good for young guys that are there. What was in shape? Yeah. yeah, I mean, nobody take. I mean, this guy's taking special mattresses and mats to lay on on the road. Is careful about his sleep, everything. A total pro's pro. So he'll fit in anywhere. Team that needs help with you know, some scoring or, you know, a winger and you know, power play one or power play two net front type of guy. Yeah. He'll fit in anywhere. I think that you can hopefully get a conditional second for him. Any other, do you expect any surprises? Uh, sorry, I lied. This is my, this is my last question. Um, at, at the trade deadline, <laughs> like around the league. I mean, something, is there any, anything you're thinking in the back of your mind, you know, this guy could get traded or this team could get this player instead of the one that they're talking about, you know, like in Boston just, or whatever. Yeah, I'd be surprised if Carlson can get moved because it's just so much money yeah. going forward. And this year's been an outlier. I mean, he looked like he was in steady decline, nose diving to earth. And then all of a sudden this year, I mean, the guy has turned back the clock. He's been unbelievable. And I think it's a problem with the NHL, to be, to be frank with you, is that a player like that, if he can't be moved, is why they shouldn't have a hard cap. It should be a soft cap and tax system because, yeah, I mean, to me, a player like Carlson being moved would does one thing. It adds excitement and it's a great story. And excitement yeah. is marketing. You know what I mean? They need you, juice. This leads, needs that kind yeah. of juice. They need a player like that to be in the playoffs when he's playing like he is. And if he went to like Edmonton, like, could you imagine the, <sighs> I mean, him, Dreisaitl, and McDavid on the ice together in a three-on-three? Um, three? Like, it's Jesus. like an all-star game. They'd be going through people, they'd have like eight goals, they'd score all of I mean, 12 just, seconds. 12 seconds, and we take them to score. Yeah, but like somebody said to me, they go, Edmonton can't defend, so let's get a defender that can't defend. <laughs> like, they can <laughs> score a shit ton. It doesn't matter, yeah. you know? But they need defensive help, but... I you, mean, you know, if you move the puck, it makes your job a lot easier. He's... Yeah, getting the playoffs though, you just don't move the puck. That's the problem. You got to be able to win two one games. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's I, I hear you. I, I, yeah, I'm a I'm a luxury tax guy myself. I don't like uh, the cap. Yeah. I think uh, the market should drive. Uh, you should be willing to pay a, a premium or a tax if your market can support it. And if not, yep. they all got to play by the same rules. Well, and frankly, yeah. the fact that the Flyers or the Rangers or Toronto has to play by the same rules as the Arizona Coyotes is bullshit. Absolutely. Bullshit. I should, they should be removed from the revenue sharing, to be honest with you. Yeah. So I have one last question for you. Yeah. Uh, I, this is the, the, this is going to be a weird one because uh, Jay O'Brien, I, mm-hmm. on, for, from what I understand, if if they don't sign him, he they get a, a, a second rounder. 
compensatory. And depending, yeah, compensatory. Depending on when he decides or or they decide they can't reach a deal depends on whether it's this year or the following year. Uh, is there have there any been you hear any talks about what's going on there? Or is, is that could be something that you know, as Isaiah just brought up, that you know we don't have a pick, you know, the you know this coming draft, and you know we don't have one next year either. So e- either Second way, it would round, help the right, team, right. but yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, what do you, is there any word on him? I know it's kind of started off a little bit better, but it's kind of flattened out for him. Yeah. I mean, he, I haven't heard any word on him, but here's my read on it. There's, I would say, no chance that they sign him because yeah. this front office doesn't have any skin in that game. They didn't draft him. You know what I mean? That was a Hextall yeah, draft pick and, and a big swing. Um, that hasn't worked out thus far. Maybe he makes it to the NHL someday, but is that guarantee worth more than a second round pick this year's draft? I don't think so. I wouldn't go down that road. I would take the compensatory pick for him in this year's draft. Um, And then if I can recoup another second round pick on conditions with James and I need to move up in the second round, I can use that pick to move me up for a player I really like. So that's what I would do. Um, I think he's kind of off the radar of a lot of people. I was just asked mm-hmm. about this. Somebody DM me the other day and asked me about that. <laughs> um, oddly enough, but um, yeah, I mean, I take the second pick and run, second round pick and run. Yeah. Um, from that right now, I just because I just can't rely on it. That he hasn't shown me enough that he's worth the risk of a player I may not get in the second round this year. So, or used to move up as a little equity in the second round if I'm able to get one for JVR. You know, if they get a pick from JVR, say it's like the 27th pick of every round for the, from that team, whatever that team is. Right. Now, all of a sudden, I have 27, but I also have Jay O'Brien, that pick sitting there, compensatory pick, and I need to move up to 21. I can use that and now move up there and get a player that I've targeted that I really like that I don't yeah. think is going to be there. So that fills a need in the second round. So, yeah, no, I got to do that all day. Sorry, Jay, but, yeah, I'm moving up. Totally. Even at his best. I mean, they have players just like him and, and Denoye, very similar. Cates yeah. is, is, is probably projects even higher than him. So nah. yeah, he's almost redundant at this point, right? Yeah. 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 If everything works out, he's redundant. If, but the that, that's is, the big yeah. yeah. And that's the problem. The if it goes in front of it and we don't know what that's going to be. So yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a good point, Jeff. I, I take the second round pick every day and all day and two times on Sunday. Yep. Absolutely. Jason, man, great, man. It's, it's great having you. Um, any final thoughts? And where can people find you on social media and all your podcasts? Uh, on Twitter, at Jason Mert. Um, we live stream Stick to Hockey Live on there, all the Flyers pre- and post-game shows as well. And then uh, Stick to Stick to Hockey, we do at least two times a week, um, usually sometimes three. Um, so you can check that out and get that on our podcast platforms as well. And then Flyers Daily, which we do every single day. As a matter of fact, I said after the game against Seattle to Brian Smith on the postgame show, I said, since uh, the team's in after the 6-2 loss, I said, since the team's in Seattle, I'll take the former drummer of Nirvana, because they're from Seattle, and Dave Grohl, who's actually from like Atlanta or, North, or South Carolina or something. And I said, in the infamous words of Dave Grohl, it's times like these you don't want to do a daily podcast <laughs> after a game like that. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So, um, and then stick to F1. will be back as the F1 season comes in a couple of weeks, two weeks time, which I can't wait for. And, uh, uh, Aji's podcast with my old radio partner, Harry Mays. We do that once a week as well. We stream that live and then, uh, that's available also on all the podcast platforms. So plenty going on. Yep. Fantastic. Jason, thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Look, look forward to having you on again. Thanks, thanks boys. Again. Bye. Take care. All right. So, um, Chef, there you go, man. Uh, we, we got, I think we got a lot of things, uh, you know, on our mind expressed to Jason, and he's like a liaison mm-hmm. to, to the team. And yet, but he keeps it real. That's what I like so much about yes. him. I mean, most of the people with the team are capable of doing that. And keeping their objectivity. And if they have biases, it's their personal biases. So I, I think some players on this team are graded on a curve. 
And I think it's because they're rooting for the guys sometimes. Yeah. And that happens. That's but true. other than that, I mean, that's, to me, that's not because they're concerned about what, what the brass might say or anything like that. But yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the Flyers have this back to back coming up with Calgary and Edmonton. And they have a couple of days off, come home. Well, on the 24th of this month, they play Montreal uh, at the Wells Fargo. And then they have one of those uh, Saturday night games in Jersey. And, of course, Jersey by then might have acquired a player. I mean, they're they were supposedly in the, in the market for Timo Meyer. Uh, that remains to be seen. He he just came up lame, I think, Timo Meyer. Um, he's got some kind of upper body injury. Mm. So who knows what's going to happen with that. In fact, I'm just I'm looking for that information right now because I, I had – had spoken about that. Gav- uh, Gavrikov looks like the Bruins are in on him, but it's um, it, the, the deal is not completed as we are recording. Yeah, Timo Meyer has an upper body injury day to day. Not sure if he will play tomorrow afternoon or not. And that comes from David Quinn, who's a coach out in San Jose. So, I mean, these, that, that's another thing about players like uh, Hayes or TDA, you know, Tony D'Angelo, is that you never know. Could be an injury. And then, like yep. you said, you know, Ryan O'Reilly's gone, and then you have Jonathan Taze off the market because he got the long COVID. We we wish him only uh, the best. Um, and it, all of a sudden, it, there could be the phone ringing, and uh, the problem is who's answering the call. That is true, and also true too. Which you know, we kind of, I guess we Jason brought it up, but you know, Ke- Kevin hasn't been playing center as of late. So if you're looking for a, I know he has great experience there, but as of late, he hasn't been playing center. So. You know, yeah, that could, if you want to pinch pennies, that's where you pinch it at right there and say, well, he hasn't been your centerman this year. So, but uh, hey, it's a trade deadline. A lot of things can happen. Can't wait for it. Can't, you know, gonna, gonna enjoy that whole day myself. I always make sure I have nothing to do that day and sit there on my big butt and just enjoy the day. Yeah, yeah. I tell you what, I'd, I'd rather have a temporary situation with Dean Lombardi overseeing things mm-hmm. than than Chuck Fletcher. And not like Dean Lombardi didn't screw up some deals or anything, but he was a GM that helped put together along uh, with a, a great organization in L.A., uh, two Stanley Cup winners, and they were a Stanley Cup challenger for, what, four or five years. So I think he's got more pedigree than than what we have right now, and and then he could step away in the off season. That's what I would want to happen. With that, and I don't think it would be too painful for the Flyers. I mean, no, I, I will be unequivocal, and I'm sure I think you pretty much agree. And I don't want to put words in Dan's mouth, but uh, Chuck Fletcher has got to go. And if he can't go by the trade deadline or before, which I agree, it's probably no very unlikely to happen. Uh, then he's got to go in the off season. Right now, it's untenable. He's a failure. It hasn't worked. And somebody's going to have to come in and clean up his mess. Yep. Maybe he could do well enough to get them off to a good start, like I mentioned. And like at least Jason agreed with that. If, if they could move one of those salaries, it would really, really take a lot of pressure off whoever is going to be running this team going forward. Absolutely agree with you there. Can't deny yeah. that. What do you, what, you got some last thoughts for, uh, for the folks? Nope. No, I think we're good. I think we covered a lot of stuff to see what's going to happen. I think that's basically, you know, every game now you're sitting there or, you know, Twitter is always open on the phone there looking to see who's getting moved, who's doing what. So it's been interesting. So I'll, I'll just keep that approach for now. Fantastic. And people can find you on Twitter at chef to the left B the number two. Yep. Yep. That's- chef to let B on Twitter. Fantastic. And of course, you can find me, Isaiah, I S A I A H underscore 520. Isaiah, don't forget that underscore 520. You can find me there. I talk about a wide variety of things. I have a farm and medical background. So if that's not your interest, I talk about music and fitness as well. And I actually mention a hockey team uh, <laughs> sometimes too. So, just a little uh, bit. Yeah, just a little bit. So listen, our next show, tentatively scheduled, is right before the trade deadline we're going to record the night of march the first as things stand right now now the the flyers play the rangers that night but that is when we can meet with our old buddy db dennis bernstein of the fourth period.com uh subject to change you know things could happen it could be a big trade he could get called away but barring anything like that we're going to have a big uh, pre-trade deadline special with him 
We're, we're going to run through the league and see who's available, uh, who's left. We'll analyze the deals that have been made so far. And, of course, we'll prognosticate uh, for the Flyers for the trade deadline, the offseason, and uh, peek into the front office and see what might happen there. Yeah. I won't be at that one if we do it on that Wednesday. I'll be down at the Rangers game in the press box representing uh, OMB and uh, Nitty Gritty. Yeah, at flyersandnittygritty.com. Good mm-hmm. job there. And uh, we'll we'll see who will be back. If, if if Dan will be back from Tasmania, his last location, <laughs> that that devil. We'll, we'll see. Oh, that was bad. But I, yeah, liked, I, know, I know. still liked it, though. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, hopefully the Flyers can pull out some points uh, in these next back-to-back uh, out in Alberta, or and may, maybe some of you are saying, nah, it's time for them to lose. <laughs> Get back into <laughs> the, uh, the Connor Bedard sweepstakes. Either way, everybody, take care.